So yeah, welcome to my session, uh, Full Power, Top 10 Power App Optimization Tips, just as David mentioned. So a little about me, uh, my name's Keith Atherton. I'm a, a Power Platform Solution Architect. I get up to some other community shenanigans now and again as well. And I'm a Microsoft Certified Trainer. If anyone wants to connect, if you've got any questions afterwards, please do just scan that QR code or search for me on LinkedIn or X. Okay, so first up, let's look at why would we optimize? Now we've seen Eliane, we've seen Daniel with these great presentations, things within Power Apps, but why would we want to speed them up or make them optimal for performance? So what we'd look at is improving that user experience, ideally improving the user satisfaction, and the key thing here is really to drive good user adoption. So it's something where we kind of want apps to really be enjoyable for people to use. They might even become champions or advocate for them or tell other people about them and just kind of have a bigger take up of the power apps. So really that's what we're, we're looking for with this. Also, you may be on a project, whether it's an external customer or someone internal within your organization, where you might actually have a project requirement for certain response time limits. That could be uh, when the app loads, it might be when a screen loads, something like that. This can be quite common in web application uh, projects as well. So a bit of homework for everyone. Uh, if you're not already familiar with this, there are performance models that already exist uh, where people have, well, quite likely teams of people, have done the work to see, you know, what kind of response times are we looking for? How do we want the app to work? So a common one out there is Rail. Uh, I believe that was developed by the Google Chrome team a while back. And Rail itself stands for R for response, a for animation, I for idle time, and L for load. So again, key things that we'd be looking for for any app or web app, uh, really to give a good user experience. So first tip, let's have a look. We're going to have to look at the uh, app on start. Uh, many of us might know this already. These are the actions that are going to run when you load up an app. So if you do too much work there, the downside might be it might take the app a while to load. So one of the alternatives to this is by using the, any of the screens. They've got an unvisible property. Looks a bit like this. So right here, I've got screen one selected. We're on the unvisible property, and we can set a few variables right there. Again, you might be pulling things from data sources or doing a bit more work, but this is where you can actually use this to kind of set things up like variables and so on. So with the screen on visible property, this is the behavior of the app when the user navigates to that screen. You can use this property just to re mention there, we can set up variables and preload data. So why would we do it here instead of app on start? Well, really, if we do too much on the app on start, it might cause the app a long time to load, where when we distribute this load, this work uh, throughout the app on all these different screens, the work's done ad hoc when it's needed. It's a bit more of a just-in-time approach. Okay, next up, tip two. So another app on start property alternative, and we've already seen some good examples of this uh, with those user-defined functions, but by using named formulas. So a quick look at where this is. Again, Daniel did a really good demo here, looking in a similar place, but in the app object, we've got the formulas property, and we can see we're actually setting a few different variables there. So we're actually hard coding some text ones. We're actually uh, pulling from a data source as well. Now, the great thing with these named formulas, uh, a few things uh, really that are useful is that the value is always available. It's always up to date when you call it. Uh, the definition is immutable, which is just a fancy way of saying that you can't change the definition after it's been set in this formulas property. But most importantly for performance is that the formulas calculation can be deferred. So again, this is a bit more of an approach as when you call it, that's when you get the performance kicking in. So again, this is another just-in-time approach. If you call that formula, great. If you don't call it, you never take the performance hit. You know, it's things like this, it can defer that execution. And also another bonus, again, along the lines of what Daniel covered in parts of his, is that this can improve reuse. Because we're using them here, they're gonna have a global scope where we can access them from anywhere in the app, which means that any page or many different controls can refer to these formulas instead of us duplicating the effort and the code throughout the app. Really, really useful. So tip number three, the concurrent function. 
So here's an example of some power effects where we're actually pulling from four different tables and storing them into four collections locally. So if we actually check the network traffic in the browser, <clears throat> we can actually see that these are run sequentially as we'd expect. So we pull from the product table first, then the customer and so on and so on. So these are actually run one by one, just as we'd hope. However, if you wrap these around a concurrent function like this one right here, all of those calls would actually set off around the same time and actually just be working simultaneously or concurrently. So <clears throat> the benefit from this, if time across the X axis there horizontally, if that's the total time for this block of code to run, and let's say this was the upload time, we was doing this in app on start or even the screen on visible, we can clearly see that the one below, the concurrent one is gonna complete much quicker. So again, this will scale up if you've got multiple operations that you want to run concurrently. Next up, tip four is the with function. Again, we saw a good example there in a, one of the demos today. Really, really good example. Here's an example of it used in a fairly basic way. So we're actually calling, we're doing some lookups on the user's table and we're retrieving a title, first name and last name. Now, using this with block, we've actually going to store these uh, variables temporarily and then actually use them below with those set function calls that we've got. So the great thing with these, they have a formula block scope. So when we're done with them here, they're not actually accessible anywhere else. The big benefit, uh, well, one of the benefits with this, uh, really in terms of optimization, is that those records are cleared from memory when the execution is complete. So they're no longer retained in memory, taking up that valuable memory space. Another big advantage of this is that they can massively improve performance as well. So if you're going to use those record values uh, multiple times, so in the example at the top, we've got three data source calls there, three trips over the network potentially. Now in this alternative block of code at the very bottom, we're actually just going to bring the record back itself, not just individual columns, and then refer to them below. So right now we've got one data source call in this new revised code where the previous one had three. So you can already see those trips across the wire, across the network have been reduced. So again, we might get a really big performance boost from this one, really useful. Another bonus with this as well, a bit like the named formulas, is it can improve the readability. Again, with those uh, with calls at the top, we're breaking something what might be a very large power effects expression down into multiple parts, so it's done in stages. So again, it can break it down to more lines, but make it more readable. Next up, tip number five, so caching data where possible. So this is where we can retrieve and then cache, and cache is just a fancy way of saying that we're going to store something in local memory within the app. So this is where we can cache uh, different bits of data using variables and collections where possible. So here's an example. We're actually going to bring uh, the user's record back by doing a lookup on the user's table, and we're going to store it into a global user. Here's an example where we're going to bring it back to just one of the columns, the title column, and store that into a variable as well. And the one at the end, this is uh, maybe not advice, but we're going to grab all the users and store it into a collection called users. So by referencing this cache data in these variables and collections, it's going to be much faster than retrieving it from the data source. Now, why is that? It's because we're not going back over the network and potentially multiple layers across the network if you're using a custom connector or some uh, on-prem data gateway or something like this you may go through multiple layers for your request but also the response that gets uh, returned as well so by calling that that memory that in-app memory where we've cached everything it's much much faster however a few considerations with this as well if we do cache that data we need to consider how frequently we've been caching it as well so how often does that data change at the source? If this is something that is a list of stores for your retail organization, it changes maybe once a month or once every few weeks, you know, doing a retrieval once a day or at the, when the app loads is maybe going to be fine, potentially. But if it's data that's going to be changing every few minutes, uh, then it may be that when you've cached this data locally, that data might become stale. It might become a bit out of date. So things like, you know, how often does it change? 
And do you need real-time data? Because if you do, it may need that trip over the network to the data source. Okay, next up, tip six is patching records fast. So many of us used to calling patch functions a bit like this. Uh, this example, we're actually going to do a for all loop, go through all of the collection of accounts or call accounts, and then do a patch for each one. So this is a bit of a, a contrived basic, basic example, but it's really going to go through them one by one by one. An alternative for that is by using the schema match approach. There's some really good blog articles out there as well. Matt Debaney, uh, Microsoft Learn has got some really good uh, documentation on this. But this is where we've got less code, but also uh, a bit like the concurrent function, these, these patch statements are going to run simultaneously. So it could likely be much, much faster taking this second approach. Next up, tip number seven, beware of data burst data, data model over normalization. Bit of a mouthful, but um, a bit of background on normalization. Uh, my background is, is mostly ProDev, lots of SQL Server, Oracle, and MySQL. Uh, and really with those different data models, we'd look to normalize the data model as much as possible. And really what that means is we'd look to reduce any redundancy. We wouldn't want any duplicated data in there or any kind of, uh, you know, uh, reuse data in multiple places. We try and keep it as lean as possible. And sometimes it might lead to a structure that looks figuratively a bit like this. Now it is zoomed out, it's, it's not intended to be readable, but really again, a very, you know, it could be a star or a snowflake schema where there's a lot going on, lots of joins, lots of foreign keys linking to other tables. And when I started with Dataverse, I tried to replicate this mindset, came back and bit me, wasn't a good idea. What I needed was something a bit more simplified, less joins, less links, something where, you know, maybe the, there might need to be some duplicated data or some summarized data in some cases, but something that didn't require too many joins and links. So sometimes that can be a bit of trial and error. Next up, tip number eight is implementing delegation where possible. So a bit of background on delegation. Uh, this is where if you have a PowerFX query within the app, that work is actually performed at the remote data source that it calls rather than it in the app itself. So the way I try and remember this is we're delegating the work from the app to the big powerful data source itself, whether that be Dataverse or SQL Server or something else. It means we're not having to bring all of the data back to the app and then do our filtering and sorting there or whatever the case may be. It's all being done at the source where possible. So again, we mentioned there only the required results are returned to the Power App. So that's really, really useful for performance because it's just potentially that smaller reduced refined data set that we need. And also delegation is possible with multiple data sources. So Dataverse, it's a first class citizen of Power Apps, but we've also got SharePoint, SQL Server and Salesforce as some other examples as well. Having a quick look at the Microsoft documentation, this is a screenshot of delegable functions and operations for Dataverse. So this can be very handy when you're writing any kind of PowerFX uh, expressions. If I go through this table, I want to use the equals operator against some text. I can see, yes, it is delegable. But if I want to use a number and run the, say, search function right here, this is not delegable. It will likely give me a delegation warning within the app itself too. So another thing to note as well is that PowerApps is limited to the first up to 2,000 records from the data source. So it's another reason why delegation is important to just bring back the data you need and not attempt to bring too much of that data back. Next up, tip number nine, uh, we're looking at the app checker. Many of us use this already, but this is great for highlighting errors and warnings for the following, and it can offer fixes as well. So things like formulas, runtime, accessibility, but also crucially for this session, performance and data source as well. The way we can see it right here is by if we look at the stethoscope uh, within the Canvas App Studio, we can see here I've actually got 12 warnings, not too good a eh, for performance. Now 10 of those are for unused variables and there are two more there for the rows retrieved from the data source may not be complete. Now, the great thing with this detail is it, we do get the location of where it, uh, the issue is, how to fix it, and why we'd want to fix it as well. Really, really useful. And the final tip, tip number 10, is the Power Apps Monitor. So it looks a bit like this when we use it. 
this is where we can actually see a list of the operations that have been called. We can see whether they're successful or not. Um, you know, we can see things like duration of how long they took. But on the right hand side, we actually get more information. We can get more details of the formula where it was called, but also the request and response if it's something over the network as well. In this case, it's uh, patching a row. And it can be quite verbose, but it could be useful if you really need it for troubleshooting. That might include errors, but also performance as well. So the great thing here, we can view events while building apps in Power App Studio. Also importantly, you can view events for published apps during runtime. So if you can't open up the studio, it's something in production or something somewhere where you can't open up the code and walk through things, it could be really useful for troubleshooting there too. You can check valuable information such as the duration of requests and errors that I just mentioned too. And you can access this using the app checker or the advanced tools. Really, really useful if you need it. So we reached the end. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Uh, again, uh, just reach out to me if you have any questions at all. Always happy to help. Thank you, David and team, for all you've done this year in the community. It's always a pleasure to be on these calls. And it's great to wrap up the year with everyone. So I'll hand back to David. Thank you. Thank you.